we're live. Before we get started with today's show, I want to say thank you to the show sponsor, the Bitbox O2 by Shift Crypto. If you are buying Bitcoin, you're a very smart person. If you are not taking self-custody of your Bitcoin, then you need to get on that right away. And the Bitbox O2 is an excellent way to do that. Go to shiftcrypto.ch forward slash rapid fire for 5% off. I'm here today with Chad Urban from the American College of the Building Arts in Charleston. Chad, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. I um, came across uh, you and the college recently. And, um, you know, I've been a a critic of the existing system of education, you know, from preschool all the way up to secondary and (laughs) post-secondary for a long time. And I've also been excited and encouraged by some of the novel approaches to education that have been emerging over the last number of years. Now, you know, in particular with uh, the advent of technology, but what you guys are doing is kind of going in the opposite direction. Uh, And I, you know, I I really, I find it really interesting and I find it really um, relevant to, how a lot of people in the world that I play in the Bitcoin world think, because uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term, but we call a lot of things that have, I guess, degraded in quality as a result of the degradation of the money, we call them fiat, right? So it's not just fiat money, but we look at architecture and building and products and we call them fiat because there's a representation in them of the degradation of money and perhaps even broader society that's going on. So uh, we will get into that, but before we do, for people that aren't familiar with you or the college, why don't you give us the rundown? Yeah, so, all right, well, do you want me to start with me, I guess? So I'm, I'm Chad Urban, that's my real name. So as much as the memes might lend itself to this, I guess we are in the simulation, right? Um, I'm a recovering attorney is usually what I tell people. So. I got out of law school in 2010, so right when the economy was just rip-roaring, um, doing workman's comp, which is right where you want to be as a young idealist, and said no to that, and ended up in higher education, and I've been with the American College of the Building Arts since 2013, it was like February-ish of 2013, um, let's see, so the college, got to give you a quick rundown. So Charleston, South Carolina got slammed by Hurricane Hugo in 89, I want to say, which was just under a Category 5. So it's a pretty serious hurricane. And, you know, we all watch hurricanes nowadays. So we kind of know, like, holy smokes, Category 4, Category 5. Those are like no joke, you know, weather services standing out there in the high tide, you know, the whole way leading up to it. The the issue with that was not only are Category 4s hugely devastating, and when I talk about hit Charleston, I mean like the eye itself was, I think, within 20 minutes of downtown. So like hit Charleston. Charleston itself is a city that's not just like a normal city. I mean, it's a very old historic city. So you have, it's not just hitting, you know, like new construction homes, right? When the storm rolled through, you're losing homes from, you know, 16, 1700s America, right? So how do we rebuild those? So th- what, one of the good things is you've got families who have kind of old money in Charleston, right? Who've been here forever. And so they had things like their slate roof in one of the real fancy homes was damaged and no one could repair a slate roof up to that standard. So they ended up flying in slaters from Wales, which is like just such a weird anecdote. And this is now in like 1990 where we're doing the rebuild. So this isn't that long ago. Right. And so you're just looking at this like, I mean, we think about after a hurricane hits, you've got like the Cajun Navy and these kind of groups who come in to like save the day in these towns. Charleston had the same thing happen. We had tons of people come in, all these contractors and everything. And then there's actually some architect quotes that we can pull up for you where it's like, yeah, these these guys, I mean, you know how to use a saw and everything, but you do not know how to do historic restoration work. I mean, it's, it's just different. This isn't just stick frame in, throw some nails in it, do 90 degree angles and call it a day. Like you actually need some higher tier of craftsmanship to deal with these restoration. And you've got things like plaster work and stone and and everything. There's a lot of masonry in the city. So what that told us was, no, first of all, no one knows how to do these skills, which we knew since the sixties, there was this, there's a big report, um, Preservation Trades Network put it out in, I wanna say 67, 68 called the White Hill Report which if you Google White Hill Report and ptn.org, you'll find it. And it was commissioned basically to analyze where we're at as far as craftsmanship goes in this country. And they 
the whole report just predicts we are going to have no one who can do these high skill trades with, you know, like we need to get on fixing this. So then, you know, if you fast forward 25 years, Hugo hits, Charleston's like, well, I guess they were right. No one can do, no one can do this. What do we do about this? So it was like kind of a local civic group. You had like the old money people with the nice homes. You had the mayor, you had a couple of um, preservationists, like a couple of various interested parties got together. And like, well, let's make a school that actually teaches this. Well, there's, there's all kinds of hoops you have to jump through to make a college. You can't just, you know, hang up a shingle and call it a day. So they went through some growing pains, like any kind of startup goes through, right? Colleges have some weird caveats too. Like a lot of people think about colleges and accreditation kind of goes hand in hand with that. You can't get accredited until you've existed for a certain number of years, right? They need to look at like, did you graduate a class? Well, if you're doing a bachelor degree, that's four years later. Do you know what I mean? Before you can even apply to become accredited, right? So there's, you sort of have to exist and show a proof of concept for a number of years, and then you can be handed the accreditation. But that's sort of a chicken and an egg problem because a lot, who's going to go to a school that's still unaccredited, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of weird growing pains that we made it through. So we're, we, we're fully accredited. We take total form um, student loans, like kind of the whole nine yards, right? The idea for the school, because there's, there's trade schools, you know, everywhere across the country, right? Except the problem was, as we saw with Hugo, like, yeah, there's trade schools, but they're not producing the kind of craftsmen that we need, right? So what do we do to get this like higher tier of craftsmen? In the US, we didn't really have a guild system we kind of sort of have apprenticeship and some industries have apprenticeships, right? Like there's different unionized skills that have fairly decent apprenticeships, but it's not really what we were looking for either. So we looked to a 10 year training system in France called the Compagnon du Devoir. So that's, I think you start around 16. I want to say it's not 18 like the U S and you go for 10 years and it's sort of like a six months on six months off kind of deal where you're learning for six months and then you go in and work for six months. Right. So it's sort of applying the skills that you learn and they do things in timber framing is one of them. And so we, do, we have a timber frame program. We have two professors who are company on graduates. Um, but we looked at this system like this is producing their most elite craftsmen that they can. How do we kind of adapt this into the U.S. sort of four year framework? What do we do? Right. So a normal four year college, most people listening probably did like, the you know, kind of the standard fair you major in comp sci, whatever, you know, your local school, you know, how you look over all your credit requirements and stuff like, I don't know, 40, 50 hours in your major, you've got a bunch of gen eds, you've got a bunch, you know, some electives and you just kind of fill it out. Right. It's like an a la carte menu. We took the idea that rather than just leaving students to choose a whole bunch of random electives, gen eds that are completely unapplied to whatever they're studying, right. We're going to set up like the whole menu ourselves of, we think you should learn X, Y, and Z to get your degree, right? Now, some requirements on colleges, usually they're done by the state, are things like, well, if you want to give a bachelor's degree, you got to teach them math, science, English, history, like those kind of things. Okay, well, so you're stuck teaching those. So what do you teach? So like for history, well, we teach architectural history, not Western Civ, right? For science, we do material science, not biology where you're cutting up frogs or whatnot, right? So all we try to take whatever we're required and relate it directly to what they're going to do, right? If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a very applied set of learning where everything kind of leans on the trades themselves at the end of the day, right? Like we have a philosophy class and, you know, it could just be, you know, read some Plato, read some Socrates, right? Instead, it's a philosophy of craft. Like what does it even, what does it mean to really be a craftsman, right? So this is kind of getting into now, at the end of the day, what's the difference between a CBA and a trade school, right? So at a trade school, normally what you're going to do, like, like let's compare, I don't know, like carpentry and what we do with carpentry, right? Because there's some carpentry trade schools. Some of them are certificate programs. So you're going, you're just doing carpentry. Some of them might be an associate. So you might do a couple of gen eds that might be related, might be unrelated. And then you've got your carpentry classes where you learn some stick framing, some, you know, use of machinery, right? Kind of basic stuff. Here, if you come here, obviously you have to do the basics. So some of that is similar, right? Our kids are doing for their carpentry classes or whatever trade they're in, blacksmithing, timber framing, plasterworking, et cetera. They're doing 15 hours of that a week, right? So 
normal college, you're in 12 to 15 hours a week for all your classes. Here you're doing 12 hours a week for your gen eds plus 15 hours a week for your trade. So you're kind of at a double load, if that makes sense. So you've got your trade, but you're being taught by, it's just a whole different tier of craftsmen. So we've got two compagnon grads from timber framing. This is just wood specific. And then a German, what is he called? He's a Tischler Meister. So he's a German master carpenter. Like he has his, you know, you can actually get a master certification in places like Germany that still do that. Whereas in the U S if you call yourself a master carpenter, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Some industries have masters, some don't. I mean, you need to have been doing it for at least 25 years to even kind of be remotely truthful in that. So if it's just a different tier of craftsmen who's teaching you the actual work, right? You couple this with the things they're learning in the gen ed classes. And so it might sound like, yeah, they're still learning a lot of stuff. If all they want to do is work with their hands, what, why bother, right? So as a good example, last weekend on Saturday, so we had a design charrette. And I don't know if, if people listening you don't know what a charrette is. It's sort of like you have some kind of issue with a building or, or piece of architecture that you're working on, right? And it's, it's got some kind of growing pains for whatever the reason is. The, the client doesn't like it. The city doesn't like it because they have to approve the design, whatever the case may be. So we have a design charrette for a home. That's, it's a residence that's being built in Charleston. Charleston's got all kinds of contortions to jump through because it's a historic city. You've got the Board of Architectural Review that has to approve everything, right? And it's this, I want to say, early 1800s uh, trolley house, right, for horse trolleys. So they've got to keep some historic character to it, right? So they're going through these growing pains and they come in and they say, we want to do a design charrette with uh, Bobby McAlpin, who's a real famous architect who, who flew in to kind of host it, right? If people haven't heard of Bobby McAlpin, just Google him and look at his stuff, he'll be blown away. Um, so he comes in and we bring in students. We have freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors there from all the different trades, right? They go through this process. It's probably from 8.30 to 5.30, where they're just working on different aspects of this building and essentially blowing it up and redesigning it completely from scratch. Now, these are like blacksmiths and timber framers, right? So they're not all just architecture students, right? This is the kind of thing you're just not going to see in, in a regular trade school. This is where we're looking at, okay, well, what's the historic character of the neighborhood? What are the adjacent buildings looking like? What kind of what does the client actually want? Like there was this whole, he wanted a conservatory and he wanted it in glass. And then it was like, yeah, but if you're, if you're going to do this in glass, a lot of times what ends up happening is it's way too hot. So do we have to build in some kind of vent system? Well, in Italy, they actually layer glass like this, sort of like shingles do. Like, what about doing something like that? How do you think that'll work? And aesthetically, I want really thin metal, blacksmiths. Are you going to be able to do this kind of really thin gauge metal? Is it going to be able to hold this up? This whole kind of design process that just, it, it's so far beyond just, Hey, here's the plans. Go stick frame this house together. Do you know what I mean? So that's that's a long rant, I guess. <laughs> I, guess. Um, I got lots of questions. I got lots yeah. of questions. My, so let's first... let's go. And as much as we want to tear down the higher ed establishment, we're we're game for that. <laughs> all right, all right, good. Um, my first question is 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 about you. Actually, you know, you your background is in law, yeah. right? And yeah. you you find yourself. I've heard you on another pod, you know, you're kind of a, a jack of all trades, officially yep. a CFO here, but COO in a number of different roles. Yep. Why? Why, why from uh, the legal profession <laughs> to uh, so, the, 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 well, re I, the revivification of craftsmanship in America? Yeah. So I'm, I don't, I don't even know how to describe myself. I went to undergrad and I went in as a criminal justice major in undergrad kind of thinking I want to go to law school. So criminal justice sort of made sense, right? Because you're supposed to be like poli sci history, so something. And I was like, yeah, I like criminal stuff. All right, let's do criminal justice and then go to law school. And I went to USC for undergrad. For whatever reason, they required five math credits as part of our gen eds. And so normally you do things like logic, pre-algebra, algebra. You might, your fifth one might end up being calculus, right? And I just knocked out all my calculuses because I had calc one already. And then it was like, I did Calc two, three, four, and one or two other classes. And I was like, why don't I just double major? So I double majored in math too, because that makes all the sense in the world to be a criminal justice and math major, right? So I'm already, you know, a weirdo doing this and then going to law school. So what, what was the applicability there? So I just ended up not taking electives and taking 500 level math classes just on a lark, I guess. 
So, so this is, this is what you're dealing with here. Why, why did you do this? It's like, why did I do a lot of things? Um, yeah. Uh, on the other podcast, I was talking about how I do a bunch of different jobs. Like I did, one of the first things I did when I came over here was I wrote a database for our academic records because they, it's, it was growing pains way back then. So they didn't have like a real formal structured database. So, it's, I mean, it's just a SQL database. It's nothing like crazy. Right. Um, but that kind of stuff, I, I didn't do comp sci, you know, I was a math major. So there's some comp sci classes you have to take. Um, but I've just been a, you know, computer door forever too. So it was like the coding is not far fetched for me. Coding the website wasn't, you know, a big stretch, you know, and it's, it's halfway decent. It runs fast, you know, so we're happy with that. Um, and then law school, I don't know if I would have stayed in law if I had gone at a different time in my life. Like going in in 07 was interesting because the economy was good. And then by winter of 08 is really when the wheels fell off. And so you just watched like the entire industry just go through this bloodbath. And the legal world was really interesting because if you think about you're like a 65 year old partner in a big firm, right? And your investments just crashed, you know, 30%, let's say, well, why not just keep working? What do you care? Like, it's not like you have a really strenuous job where you needed to retire at 65. Mm -hmm. So you saw so many partners just say the hell with it. I'll just keep working. We'll recover and then I'll retire. Right. Because I don't want to start living off really down investments, right? Because they didn't invest in Bitcoin, right? <laughs> um, so then, well, once that happens, then the guys right under them who are supposed to move up and take their spot then didn't move up, right? So it just kind of goes on down the totem pole. So the guys at the low end who would be like the law students just getting out of school who should enter as, you know, the new associates getting hired by the firms, there are so few openings then. I mean, law school, you do a lot of, um, you do your internships each summer, right where you work at a firm where you're a summer associate, so many of those jobs were just going away. I mean, one of the firms I interviewed at, they, they would normally hire, it was like four to 500 and they were taking sub hundred that year. Mm -hmm. So it was just a bloodbath. So you kind of took what you could get and it was like, is this really what I want to do? Like, I kind of just went, you know, 18, straight out of high school, go to college. Okay, do okay in college, go straight into law school. And now you're just like looking around at the world, like, is this really where I want to be? And I'm in workman's comp, like, Really? <laughs> what, am, what am I doing here? And we were still in Ohio at the time. And my wife, my wife is Brazilian. So she wanted nothing to do with staying in the snow forever. Right. She wanted to get back to the South. So we went back to South Carolina and she was an early education major. So we sort of said, well, her parents lived in Columbia, South Carolina. And we were like, all right, we'll just stay with them for a month, find some jobs in South Carolina because we're getting the hell out of here. Whoever lands a job first, we move to that city. And it was like May, June, I want to say, when we moved back down here. And she landed a job right away because they were hiring for teachers, right, for the next you know school year cycle. And she got a job in Charleston. So I was like, okay, I guess we're going to Charleston. Um, and then I got a job a little bit after that at a different college um, as a program director for their gen ed program. So it started kind of getting me into the world of higher ed, right? And my wife, oddly enough, ended up volunteering at ACBA just in her free time. And was like, hey, this is this really cool school in town. You should go check it out. They need people who can do stuff. So then I came over here, talked to them, and started working here shortly after that. So, so it was sort of my luck, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, what that's what it sounds like. But was there, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at some of your, your tweets, and obviously you stayed. So yeah. what is it about what the college is doing? The ethos of what they're, I guess, trying to, to bring back uh, is appealing to you. Like, what about the philosophy is, is appealing to you? Whew, this could be a real long answer. <laughs> <laughs> they all have been short. Don't, don't do it too long. <laughs> We've got that much time. I mean, like one of the things, so... First of all, we don't have a huge admin staff here. It's basically the president. You've got myself who's sort of in charge of the non-academic stuff, let's say. And then you've got, who he's our head of academics, which would be like the provost, right? At, an, at a large college, because yeah, they have deans. So you need a provost above the deans. So it's kind of the three of us and then our head of fundraising, right? Who kind of make all the decisions here. So me and, um, me and the head of academics, whenever we talk about just the state of higher ed in general, I mean, 
looking over this landscape of what's going to happen, we keep saying kind of tongue in cheek, like in 10 years, I don't know how half, half these colleges haven't shuttered their doors in 10 years. I just don't see a future for so many of them. And COVID really made that rapidly apparent. I mean, there are so many colleges that exist just because they've existed at this point. Like you have things like if you think back, I don't know, let's, let's cherry pick some examples. So you take, so I went to Ohio State. So let's look at Ohio State. You've got Ohio State and then you've got schools like University of Dayton, University of Toledo, University of Akron, right? all these kind of different schools. So if you want to be an English major and you live in Ohio, is there a big difference between going to Ohio State, Toledo, Akron, to, right? Dayton? Not really. By and large, there, it's going to be the same type of program. So why do these schools exist? Well, first of all, we didn't commute as much, you know, 50 years ago, right? So if you lived in Toledo, you went to the local school, right? Lived at home, went to college there. Okay, so that makes sense. We don't have that problem anymore, right? I'm from New Jersey and I went to school in South Carolina, right? People go all over the place. Okay, so that removed the need for it there. Then the second thing is when COVID happened, you had all these, well, let's just do online courses for a year. Well, once you open that door, which you have to accept the argument that online is as successful as in person, which I don't accept, but those colleges have made that argument and they are not charging less. So presumably they're at least halfway believing that this is true, right? Well, if that's true, why don't we shutter every college in this country and teach at America University and you just have breakout Zoom sessions and you hire whoever the best English 101 professor is to deliver that lecture and the best thing, you know what I mean? The best for each of these tiers, because yeah. these are all just the same gen eds, right? You don't need to be doing them hands-on as they just told us, right? For a full year. So, and then I could hire, you know, a couple of the just below the top tier professor as the TAs to grade all the assignments, right? And then everyone else is laid off. I mean, I don't see how they haven't just signed their death warrants doing this. And if you think about what happened to the Rust Belt when manufacturing left, like what does a place like Massachusetts look like without these colleges? Like all of these college towns that exist to prop up local economies that you've just created as useless redundancies. And so you look at something like ACBA, we were one of the first colleges who reopened for in-person that was back in... I think it was mid-May of 2020. So this is like the governor shut down. I think it was meetings over 10 people in person. So like, okay, we can't have anything, right? And we've got pretty small class sizes. So we don't have quite the same kind of worries that the big colleges had. Like we don't have a 300 person lecture hall where it was like, oh God, we can't possibly do this. You know, we have, it's like shop spaces. So there's huge open air, you know, we have literal big ass fans in the shop. So there's, there's tons of open airs, tons of windows, biggest classes are like 10 plus people, 10 to 20 people. So it was small ranges We're like, we'll just wear masks and come back to school. Plus you can't really teach blacksmithing on zoom. Right. So it was like, we have to come back to school, you know, and we saw other colleges just doing crazy things like, well, we'll do chemistry online. And we'll just have the teacher do the lab and you guys write the lab reports. And it's like, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> how, how can you possibly think this is equivalent? So there's, there's just all these factors weighing against these other colleges. And I, I forget which college it was. And I, I don't know that I would name drop them if I did remember, but it was right. It was a little before COVID and they were hiring a new president. And one of the things in the job description was they needed the president to come in there and redefine the mission. And it was like, you don't know what your mission is. Like, why the hell are you a college that has however many thousand kids and all these buildings and all these all this acreage and you don't even know what your purpose is? And you're just broadcasting this to the world, like unashamed? This, that's just madness. <laughs> so that's, that's the state of higher ed. So that's why I'm here is like, we're, we're these iconoclasts who are trying to just keep fighting against every... We sort of have joked that we, we operate under that, that Seinfeld episode where George just does the opposite of whatever his gut instinct is. Right. So whatever right. higher ed does, we're like, just do whatever, just the opposite. That, that was the wrong answer. Do the opposite. Right. Let, let me ask, wrong answer. Let me, do the opposite. <laughs> let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I opened the show with a bit of a commentary on, on why uh, 
a speculation on why craftsmanship has been in decline over the last, you know, 50 to 100 years, let's say. Yeah. Uh, why do you think as we, you know, push forward into modern times, that element of society has diminished and been left behind? And why, if you think there's a, a resurgence occurring right now, why do you think that is? So why has it been left behind? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, it's cheaper to do crappy construction. I mean, you buy a new house today, depending on the builder, there's some good new home builders, but if it's, you know, your kind of stereotypical new build, right? It's just some stick frame drywall junk that's designed to last a day past the mortgage. You've got nail pops within two years and it just, it's completely cookie cutter and soulless, right? Mm -hmm. But it was cheap. Right. So this is why we started doing it. And it was easy to find labor because it didn't require a lot of craftsmanship. Right. So it's it's just, again, been that that drive for, I don't know, scale and cost effectiveness. The cheapest is the best, I guess. Mm -hmm. So there's been that just in the construction industry in general. Now, there's kind of weird things that sort of work in the favor of craftsmanship, which don't necessarily seem like they're geared toward craftsmanship, but they sort of, but they are at, at like a second level, right? So stuff like all that's in the news right now is the politics on stuff like the Green New Deal. We keep yelling about what, what are we going to do for climate change and environmental, whether you believe, don't believe, whatever the case may be, right? You take an example, like the head of our timber framing program. So he was a company on grad. His masterpiece was on a 900 year old roof system that survived. How in the hell are we not pushing things like this for the Green New Deal when instead we're going to do all this cheap construction that will fill landfills in 30 years and we'll just keep keep producing these when we could just look at doing something that's a little more expensive, that requires more artisans from the get go, but lasts. Now, in America, something like a 900 year old roof system just sounds insane because the, our timeline is just in nowhere in the same realm. But it's like these techniques aren't new. We know how to do it. It just takes some training to be able to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that where it's, you know, maybe we, you can get on board, you know, stuff like the environmental lobby. And, and like the city of Seattle passed an ordinance, I want to say it was like 2018, 2019, where they could do five or six stories with a timber frame structure. So they're high rise buildings, it's not a huge high rise. I mean, it's not gigantic, but that's still pretty big could be done in a timber frame, which is really nice to see. You're seeing some cities do things like that. So that gives me some hope. Um, at some point, the pendulum swings back, right? We were in this, you know, just the cheapest is the best route for a while. Now you're getting pushback to that. I mean, like anecdotally, we, we can see that. I mean, there's, there's so few plasterers left in this country. It's just crazy. Um, so there's, there's guys like, uh, one of our graduates who was, what was he, a graphic designer um, before he came back to school in his 40s, too. He came back, he became a plasterer, right? He was just done with software in the world of graphic design. He's booked out. He's, he's nine or 12 months out right now just doing mm -hmm. plaster work. And plaster work mm -hmm. isn't even in every like locale of the country or everything, right? But it's just it's so hard to find anyone who can do these things, <laughs> which I guess is, is, is a pro and a con, right? Is this going to come back? Well, there, even if there's an infinite demand for these skills, there's not enough people who can do the skills. So like a, some more kind of anecdotes, we had the architect of the U.S. Capitol's office come down here in the fall of 19, I want to say. So the architect of the U.S. Capitol is a government agency that's in charge of maintaining all all these various buildings, you know, in DC. So it's, this is like the halls of Congress, the Supreme court building, botanical gardens. They don't do the white house. That's a separate group, but it, it's the vast majority, right? Like what you think of when you picture DC, right? They came down to our school because they couldn't hot, they couldn't find a plaster for a job. opening. So they'd had a job opening for a year or two, right? Couldn't find a plaster. So they called us up and they're like, Hey, we really can't find a plaster. And we're like, don't we know we were trying to hire a plaster professor because you needed another one at the time, like, tell me about it. They're all like, yeah, we're, we're booked solid for, for years at this point. You know, we're not, we're not taking any new jobs. So he said, oh, okay, okay. We didn't know if you had any references. Um, do you mind if we come down and talk to your kids though? And I was like, okay, well, why do you want to come down? I mean, we're a tiny little college because they wanted to come down and do like a, 
a job fair kind of pitch why you should work for the architect of the capital's office, which was pretty good starting jobs. I mean, it's in the 50s, starting pay straight out of college, and it's a government job, so it's got the full benefits package, federal retirement, all that kind of stuff built in. So your fringe benefits are through the roof, too. So it's a pretty good straight out of college job, right? We said, well, I mean, how many people do you need? You know, what, what are you even looking at? How many trades? So this is, this is back in 2019 when they came and they told us, all right, well, we're looking at 2020 and 2025 as kind of our year marks. And by 2020, it'll be half of us will be retirement eligible in our department. And 25, it's over 75% retirement eligible. These are the people maintaining the halls of Congress. <laughs> we're going to have three quarters of them retirement eligible within a few years, and they have no idea where the pipeline is going to come from to replace them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this is like the, the lack of actual craftsmanship in this country is astounding. Colonial Williamsburg called us up, which used to be the hallmark, and they actually ran an apprentice program trying to set up something to work with us to train people to work at Williamsburg because they don't know yeah. where to find people. So there's all these different industries where we're like, there is so much demand, like just how how is the world not seeing this? How how dire of a situation we're in? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. It's one of the things that drew me to uh, you know looking into the college and, and setting this up. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one, a lot of kids are encouraged or funneled these days into an education that has very little practical use. You know, you you go into college and you just do something for the sake of doing it, for getting your piece of paper, and that's even how sure. it's how it's framed for you. Well, it's you go out into, yeah, exactly. And you, you, you go out into the world and you expect it to be, you know, you to be able to provide value as a result of that. And oftentimes that's not the case. And so there's this big, you know, mismatch between what's required and, and what people are funneled into. And, you know, I think there's many reasons for that, but another, you know, interesting element. And I looked at the Instagram page for the college and, you know, it's really amazing. Some of the, the things that the students are turning out, you know, whether it's woodworking or whether it's uh, yeah. sculpting or whether it's blacksmithing. I mean, and it's really cool to see. And, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot in the Bitcoin space is how sound money has the effect of lowering people's time preference. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you could make a strong case that one of the manifestations of the type of money that is used globally today and one of the effects on our society is that we have a far higher time preference, right? People want the gratification immediately. People want to just get it out the door as quickly as possible, as cost effectively as possible and kind of long-term considerations be damned. And uh, what's emerging in, in the space and a lot of the people I talk to is a respect and a reverence and a desire for a hearkening back to craftsmanship that in which the, the work is apparent right? Things that it's apparent took great skill and even great time. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's, it's fascinating that, that the, the, the money that people kind of use as their own personal unit of account has that effect on things. Um, but I think it's also indicative of how far we've, we've kind of fallen into the trap of educating our, our students, educating our society around things that are, uh, yeah, that, that don't have that much practical application. I think maybe we're seeing, you know, the results and the consequences of that now. What you mentioned before that, uh, you know, this, the, the curriculum is interesting in that it's not just the craft and it's not just the hands-on craft and it's not just, you know, people being taught by people with, a, you know, an extremely high level of, you know, craftsmanship. You mentioned people in, from, from Europe, but it's paired with an education that helps to fill out the why of the craft, let's say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you a bit about the philosophy of, of craftsmanship, like why, how that, that aspect of the curriculum is taught and why it's important for, why you think it's important for the students to get that. Yeah, so there, there was a lot in that too that I can follow up on. Um, so let me try to go, as far back when you started. Okay, so one of the things you said people go and get useless credential degrees, right? There's so many students we get who studied historic preservation as a degree, which a number of colleges have historic preservation programs. They go through a four-year program and never pick up a tool. So these, these are college programs essentially training museum docents, right? They have, they have no idea how to actually fix anything, which is just shocking, right? So we... 
we try really hard to make the link between what's wrong with this building, how do we fix this building? So I, identifying what's wrong is one thing. Creating a plan for how to fix it is another. And then actually executing a fix, right, is kind of the third step there. And so just on that note, we're working with a, with a college that has a full historic preservation department. And we, our students are writing the preservation plans for all their historic structures on campus. So our students are not historic preservationists, right? They take historic preservation as part of their gen eds, but they have enough craft and preservation hands-on experience that that college contacted us specifically to write their preservation plans for their buildings, which is astonishing when they have an actual department in-house that they could lead, right? The second thing would be sort of what our mindset is, what we're trying to produce as a graduate is they get a degree which satisfies the credentialist aspects of our society nowadays, much as we might hate them it's still just part of the atmosphere, right? So at least the kid, they have the degree. Second, they have a trade now. So we, try, we train them up to what a journeyman level would be, which is hard to define because we don't really have journeymen in the US, but there are some groups like the Timber Framers Guild exists, Abana exists for blacksmiths. And they usually have things like a, a journeyman in blacksmithing should be able to do da, 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 right? So make sure our kids can do all that, which usually they've done that by the second year that they're here. Right. So they're above that, but they're not masters, you know, a 20 year off kind of time horizon. So they're they're a journeyman. <clears throat> and then the third way is there's so many jobs that are there's sort of like white collar, blue collar jobs that exist. So these are and colleges are starting to realize that these exist. So you see things like construction management programs now cropping up, which are essentially just professional studies degrees with a little bit of construction flavor. So our, what we normally end up finding is kids get hired on at a company and they real, the company itself, assuming it's a big company, it's not like a small kind of in-house company, realizes this is someone I can have as the project manager, foreman, et cetera. So like not only can they build, they can work in the office and do things too, right? Because that's, you might not want to do that when you first get out. And most of the people who are in their 20s do not want to work in an office, right? They want to work with their hands. But the issue is always, well, what if you throw your back out or something, right? While you're working and you're in your 30s or 40s, what do you do then? You're not pigeonholed because you've got this such a broad skill base that you can lean on with both design work, you understand permitting and licensure and, and all these different review processes that you, you know normally you wouldn't. And maybe in a company, you could have been a guy who was hired on as just a guy and you promoted just within the company, right? Which happens naturally. But a lot of times what they end up doing is just hiring, you know, business grads and, and hoping they can train them enough in construction to make that transition. Whereas our kids are kind of already ready made to do either the hands-on work or the office work or both, you know, some days kind of vice versa. So then you asked about philosophy and just in general, what it means to be a craftsman, which is a huge question that I should probably have someone like Joseph's real good to answer that who teaches our philosophy of craft class. He's our stone carving professor. And you look at his stuff and you'll just get blown away. Um, Ken Cannon Studios is his. And he used to be in Austin. So a lot of his stuff's out in Texas. Um, but at least for me, some of the craftsmanship, I think it's best shown. We get a lot of veterans at ACBA. Now, whether they did an eight year contract, you know, which is the bare bones, you know, like a three by five, or they did a full 20 years, took retirement, right? We get a lot of veterans. It's not a lot like thousands because we're a tiny college, but percentage wise, a lot of veterans because they want to do something with their hands because they've been in the military. They like being out and doing things, right? It's cathartic. A lot of them might have various flavors of PTSD, right? And it's just, it, it's very soothing to create something, right? Tangible. And then you take that with one of the things we really try to do in the trade shop is we could do things like, let's say the wood shops learning how to do a staircase right now, right? Well, you could just build a staircase in the shop and then, you know, throw it in the corner or break it and do another, right? We try as much as we can to fit real world jobs with what we're doing in the class. So there might be a historic home that needs, you know, a new staircase done or a refinished it, whatever the case may be. And so we'll look at, okay, well, we can take you in the spring of 22, if you're happy to wait, and the students will do it. So the 
homeowners happy because they're getting it at a lower rate than what commercially it would be. And the students are happy because they get to work on a piece that they can then look at and see installed in the real world and know that like I had a hand in doing this. And they know like you can just you can just see all the craftsmanship that goes into doing this. It didn't take, you know, just a few hours because there's all this joinery that goes into this staircase to make it last, right? They didn't take shortcuts, you know. The first year of the wood shop, for example, there's so much hand tooling before they do um, just, you know, full machinery, right? So cutting dovetails by hand, you know, like one of the first, not one of the first, but one of the last projects they do freshman year is in our library, we've got a, we started a rare book collection modeled after Thomas Jefferson's collection, which you're not supposed to do in the US anymore, right? Our founding fathers are kind of ultra, right, at this point. So we, we started this whole collection modeled after Jefferson, because if you remember when Congress burned, Jefferson lent his collection to Congress to kind of restart the Library of Congress, right? When he lent his collection, Jefferson, because he was, you know, an art, he was such a polymath, but he was an architect too. He designed what we call Jefferson book boxes. And there are these, his bookshelves, and they were essentially done in three tiers for the different size books. So there's folio size and kind of your regular generic book size, right? And there's sort of just a box like tilted where the opening faces out so you can read the spines, right? And his idea was if I ever need to move them, like he ended up doing, sending them to Congress, I can just pull it out, nail a lid on, you know, and it's good to go. It's a book box, ready made. So that's, that's the last project that the students do freshman year. And it's a ton of dovetailing done in Sapile wood, which if anyone's worked with Sapile, it's pretty wood, but it's a pain in the ass to dovetail because it splinters real easily. So that takes just minute, slow time, right? Where you're working with this. There's a lot of the dovetails that go on and there's a footer at the bottom of the bookshelf. So it's three tiers of book boxes and then kind of a real fancy bottom piece with feet. Um, and it just, I don't know, it just teaches you so much of respecting the material because if you try to force it, it's not gonna work, right? It's just working, I don't, I don't know. It's just, you can't rush it. Right. And like the blacksmiths, for example, like there's so much, there's so much artistry that goes into blacksmithing. And one of our professors kind of said it best. He's like, I mean, they have to be able to draw when they come here and, and we've got drafting classes and drawing classes and everything that they have to do because you think about working with metal and you're doing some kind of like scrolled piece of metal. Right. So you've got this picture in your mind of what you want this to look like. Usually they've drawn this out, whether to scale or not, right? Because when you get that metal hot, it can't be at that point where you're like, how do I want this to look, right? You've got to already know. So there's all this different artistry that goes in even before you've lit a fire in that shop, right? So I, there's just, there's a lot of aspects to this, to the different, what we mean by craftsmanship, I guess. Does, this could cover does, does craftsmanship evolve? Like, does it permit innovation? You know, because like, let's, obviously it was developed to a certain point at some time. And let's say we lost it or forgot it or did away with it in favor of this cheap, you know, expedient yeah. garbage. And now we're bringing it back and people are getting an education in it and there's, there's value in it. But is there such a thing on improving on the craft or is that kind of beyond the purview of what kids are learning at the college? So if you look at something like classical architecture, because we teach architecture here and it's specifically in classical architecture and design, which really at the undergrad level, you can either go to ACBA or Notre Dame and everywhere else it's going to be modernist. And it's not just modernist everywhere else. It's, it's outwardly hostile toward classical modernists, <laughs> right? So when we talk about what, what is what does classical architecture mean or what is this about? Because this is kind of getting into your question. Classical architecture is centered on the human and the human experience and humans will inhabit this space, right? So you, much as we think of like all the ornament and design on these buildings, you might think this is like just an ego thing, right? It's much more centered on this is what will appeal to humans. Humans are going to live here. So there's some sense of, how are we going to vent and heat this, even if we didn't have centralized AC, right? 
Whereas nowadays we're just building like glass boxes that cost a fortune to heat. And we're just like, whatever, just throw a couple more tons of AC on it. It's fine. We'll call it a day. Right. So we're looking at just the human experience in that building. Right. And so when we talk about, can we improve upon this design? I mean, always, right. As long as we're taking into consideration, that is sort of your basis. Like the proportions of the human body reflect a lot through classical architecture. Right. So when we take those things in, we, you don't have to build just columns everywhere. Right. It doesn't that doesn't have to be it. But there's all these different aesthetic design principles that can still look upon that and say, like, well, people are going to live in here. How do we want this to actually look and feel and, and flow right in this building? Do we like like we had this whole open floor plan everywhere kind of trend for a while. And now there's some pushback going back to rooms. People are liking rooms better because it's. You know, if you're in an open floor plan, you're seeing everything at all the time. There's no privacy, right? So should we go back toward rooms or not? You know, and that's a principle that's founded on how does the human experience living in this, you know, in this home, right? So I, I think you can keep improving and there's, there's no stopping that. And there can be things like modern our modern technology, you know, is a steel frame bad or good versus a wood frame? Like there's pros and cons for all these kinds of things that aren't necessarily bad is, having a, a glass facade, good or bad, right? You wouldn't have seen that in ancient Rome, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's just how we execute these kind of things. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the construction that the kids do here, as much as we're doing old school techniques, a lot of their build is on new construction, which is still going to take into consideration a lot of this, what improvements do we have now, right? Yeah, I, I, I feel like, I, you know, I like that characterization and I feel like we build ourselves in many ways into our tools, into our environments and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, as you say, there's a reason for that. There's a wisdom in that. There's a reason why that happened in the past. And, it, and you know, if we take that as, you know, a truth or at least an arguable truth that we build ourselves into in, ourselves into our spaces, what does it say that we've built these sterile, open, plain, you know, uh, spaces with no real character minimalist right yeah you know what what does that say about us that we're building those spaces for ourselves to reside in because we are impacted by the environment we're in there's no question about that it's a it's a you know you look at things like what are the famous pictures of different cities and it's so much of our urban planning is just because of cars what what can we do how why can we make the streets and how can we impact traffic flows right but then you look at what's a picture of new york and it's always like something from dumbo looking at the bridge right like these kind of different images charleston gets tons of pictures why well i mean these you couldn't build a lot of what you see in charleston in different cities because the codes aren't going to let you do this like oh there's cobblestone here and how far are you off the street right how big is your sidewalk like these kind of things no we can't do that And yet those are the most popular lasting images from all these places. We look at places in Europe and people love these quaint towns that are tiny and they have all these like little picturesque things. And we don't have that anymore. We're just sitting on the highway in Houston, right? And just, and just living in this. And we're like, okay, so we, we realize, you know, deep in here, this is what we're drawn to and we want, but we just, we don't want to live there every day. Like, how does that make any sense? Well, I, you know, like I said, I'm just, one of my contentions is that we've been kind of forced out of that way of thinking kind of surreptitiously and unbeknownst to ourselves. And I'm wondering, I know that you guys teach uh, finance of some kind in, at the yeah. college. Do you, is there a philosophy of money course? Do you <laughs> dig into uh, the different forms of money and what kind of manifestations in architecture and culture they, they inspire? We haven't, that's actually a neat idea for a class though. Although that's going to end up with me having to teach it. So you're just giving me more work. <laughs> <laughs> Why no, is that something, like is that, something that you're, you're knowledgeable about? Oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. Though. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to what you're saying. You know, when you were kind of tearing down, what does fiat mean at the beginning? Mm-hmm. Right. And at the end of the day, is it, is it based on something tangible or not? Right. Is where we're getting at. And so what, what is a, a, a new development that goes up into a community that's just a bunch of cookie cutter, stick frame together, drywall buildings other than Fiat, right? Mm-hmm. It, is, it is utterly soulless, right? So we're trying to get removed from that. Now, at the same time, you, can, you don't have to go back that long. Like if you look at really famous buildings, like take the Steinway building in New York, right? 
if you look at the actual plans, like the building plans for that building, you'll see neat things like they're going to do like an ornamental plaster piece on this wall, right? So now we think kind of modern day, how would we do that? Well, the architect would draw what they want, right? Back then it just said ornamental plaster. And that was up to the plasterer on site to figure out what would fit in this space, given the character, the art period that we're using, kind of the dimensions of the building, what's gonna work with the space, right? At some point in time, our society made the decision that you wanna work with your hands, go left, and you wanna work as an architect or in the office, go to the right, right? We just divorced these skills. And so we're trying our damnedest to bring these skills back together into this merger now where whether you're a blacksmith or an architect, because there's so many architects, if you talk to any home, any kind of contractor, right? GC, home builder, whatever, what do they think about architects? They can't stand them because none of them know how buildings stand up, how the, right? They just know how to make models. So we, we're trying to fix both sides, I guess, of that. So make the craftsmen more involved in designing features and make the architects more involved in how a building is built, right? And how it stands up. And so that's, that's a long tangent off of fiat, <laughs> but at the same time, I guess we're trying to bring tangibility into all of these aspects, I guess is where well, I'm going with that. Yeah. And I think that's precisely one of the points here is that, uh, you know, money is about time, your, our relationship to time and our relationship to work. And if it doesn't represent those properly, then because it's the thing that facilitates all other activity in a, in a market, that's going to permeate all of those other activities. So when we look and say, if we've moved from a money that requires real work and real time to create or acquire, let's say something like gold, just to bring it right, back to right. older times. And then we move to a money that requires no time nor any work to create. What, how will that imbue all the other things that are downstream of it? And I think yeah. you could make a fairly strong case and a strong correlation that the relationship to time and work, when the money has a strong foundation in that, will be represented in, let's say, architecture and building, right? People will have a low time preference. They'll, want, they'll, they'll both want and need to build quality into their work, and they'll, they'll take the time required to do that, versus when the money doesn't have that, you get something that's not tethered very deeply into uh, quality work, nor the time required to do so. And so, um, you know, that's why I think, uh, you know, the philosophy of money is, is intimately wrapped up into any professions or any, uh, uh, you know, work that requires, you know, genuine, uh, you know, a, a genuine time commitment, both to develop the skills to do it, and then to actually build what those skills have been acquired for. And, uh, you know, I think if you, you overlay that lens on a lot of things that exist in the modern world today, it's, it, you could probably apply that to a lot of places, I guess. Is the best well, way I think that's a problem with work itself writ large nowadays. I mean, so much work is just, you're just chasing a paycheck in so many different careers, car mm -hmm. well, jobs or careers, right? So many people are just selling their souls for a paycheck, right? And we're trying to create a place where, the students go off, land these great jobs, and they're doing work that's fulfilling for their souls, right? Because, I mean, work has become such a pejorative nowadays, right? Like nobody wants to work anymore, whereas it could be very meaningful depending on what you're doing, right? And that's not like some giant corporatist saying, I want everyone to work forever, right? This is sort of like, like, let me take, let me cherry pick an example. So we had a, we had a student who is our valedictorian uh, she was the class of, I want to say 2019. And we, we do summer internships each summer. So she had a, you know, an internship freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, right? And her junior year one was at Mount Vernon, right? So obviously Mount Vernon is one of the more famous houses in this country, right? So she goes to Mount Vernon, blows their doors off, comes back for her uh, senior year, right? There's two or three different companies who specifically called up and said, please let Patricia know, like we're holding a job for her if she wants it. And then Mount Vernon calls us and tells us we're creating a line item in our budget to take someone every summer because of how good she was. Right. And we want her to know that we're opening a job specifically and, and we'd love to hire her. Right. 
So this girl, she's, she's a senior in college with all these different, like very lucrative job offers, right. In a field she loves, she takes first, she takes none of them right? <laughs> because, you know, it's just a bounty of riches. She does a one-year fellowship in France at the Coubertin fellowship, which is this like very elite fellowship. They've only started taking Americans within the past decade or so. We've had five kids actually go there. Um, and they work on stuff like we actually had a Cooperton after Notre Dame burned, who was up there assessing damage, right? So they work on it, it's it's the pr- the prime places in France, right? She does a one year at, at the uh, at the Cooperton, and then she lands a job where she's timber framing in the Swiss Alps. So she's in her I guess mid twenties now, working a great job in the Swiss Alps making giant timber frame structures, like. <laughs> Amazing. You know what I mean? Like how many 20 something year old, you know, do we have in this country who are like stuck at a dead end job, hating their lives, who are like, why am I, what, what is the point of work? Whereas she goes to work every day and just loves her life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because she pursued something that was fulfilling and she found an environment that's fulfilling. Like there's all these kind of great things where it's like, work doesn't have to be terrible. We're just pursuing all these terrible avenues of work. Right. Because our society in general has funneled us into terrible avenues of work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly the point. And again, why I think the philosophy of the philosophy of money is relevant, because it begs the question, why has the imperative just to kind of come out of a cookie cutter system and and get as quickly as possible, you know, into the system, as it were, to try to make money and keep pace. And, and there's again, I think there's many social security, right? Everyone's going to retire. <laughs> you can't try to know it. Yeah. And, and there, look, there's many, there's many reasons for that. But one certainly is, is that when you debase the money at a certain rate and wages don't keep pace, then people have to, can, you know, there's a greater imperative, there's a greater urgency and anxiety to actually make money and make ends meet. And the wider those two things diverge, the greater the anxiety. And so I think people don't have the opportunity nor the freedom to analyze themselves, whether this be in the K to 12 or, or the, unit, the post-secondary realm to say, what is it that's going to make me feel like I'm doing meaningful work? What is it that is going to be a pursuit that I'm going to be happy to refine and, you know, a journey to go on for my career and improving whatever my craft is, be it hands-on or not? What is something that I'm going to be able to take pleasure in? What is something that I'm going to be able to derive dignity from? These, you know, these considerations are, you know, are gone out of, an anxiety and an imperative to just get in and start, you know, making money to try to keep pace, to, to, to stay on the hamster wheel as fast as it's spinning. And again, I think a lot of this tethers back to what we've done to the money and, and, and how we've lost a tether to a, you know, a sound real money. And again, why I think it's, it, it would be an interesting to co- component for you guys, but what I, what I think is great in, in what you guys are doing even though the broader society has not maybe shifted, you know, in, in a large way yet, I think at least you guys are providing an outlet for those people that, you know, for whatever reason, defy that, that traditional route and, and are maybe, you know, a bit stubborn and saying, no, like I, I don't want to go down that way. That doesn't appeal to me at all. That doesn't speak to me at all. I want to do something that I find meaningful, enjoyable. And that, and that, as you say, work's not going to be, 50 years of hating your fucking life yep. work, work can actually be something that's additive to your life that's not just paying your bills but it's paying your bills while giving you something to refine while allowing you to develop a craft that's actually contributing to the corpus of you know humanity let's say to the the flourishing and beauty of humanity and uh, the fact that you guys are you know uh a pioneer in putting this together and putting it together in a really unique way, which is not just the work, but actually kind of the meaning behind the work is uh, I think approaches like that as we move into a Bitcoin denominated future, which is my, my contention and a sound money future where we do away with this ridiculous approach to money we've had over the last 50 years will become more and more, uh, you know, available more and more pervasive because that, that the, that manner in engaging work will be more appealing to more and more people, I think. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And interestingly, like some of, some of the programs it's easy to recruit for, 
because there's things like Forged in Fire where people watch this and they have this romantic ideal of being a blacksmith, right? And right. everyone knows about woodworking. They might not know what timber framing is, but they know what carpentry is, right? And so they find us and that, that's really easy. But then we've got programs like stone carving and plaster that are really hard to recruit for because there's not a lot of high school kids who think about carving stone, right? right. Or they might live in like Vegas and they've never even seen plaster or heard of it. And so we keep going through this, this kind of question and answer of what, what do we do to attract more students into those programs? And there's so many kids who want to be artists in this country. And then their parents go, Jesus, they're going to live at home forever. Like, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to pay for school where you can draw for, you know, a couple of years and that's it. And it's like, we've got students back here carving stone. Like, do you know how much artistry goes into? This isn't like a fireplace mantle, you know what I mean? That you could just have a machine CNC out, right? right. Like we've got a, a sophomore back there who's starting on veil work. So you think about those models done with like drapery. So she's just now starting to do some of that. And you're like, oh. like the things I see in museums, I could just go here and I can draw and I can just, you know, be with my headphones and for hours and just working on stone in my own world, like making whatever my vision is come to life. And it's like, yes. And you can get hired doing this. And it's like, there's nobody knows how to do it. Yes. Like there's, there's a giant need. No yeah. one knows there's no supply at all. Like, and you get to pursue what you want in art. You know what I mean? But you can't just run into every high school in the country and yell, like you guys, there, there is a path here. <laughs> do you know what yeah. I mean? Like well, the like master the students redid, there's a hallway in the, in this, uh, in this building that was just sort of, you know, two hallways intersecting, right? So it's just right angles everywhere. So they went in there, they took out all the right angles, made them into curves, put niches in where the stone carvers are going to carve statues of various saints, I think is what they're doing, you know, for, for all the trades. And they're now redoing a whole, the whole ceiling. And I think they're doing like a Celtic design for that. So this is like, how can we blow this up and make it look cooler, right? So now it's, you know, a circle instead of just these, these right angles, kind of, you know, perpendicular lines hitting. How can we design a, a ceiling that'll look cool? You know, how are we going to make the molds that'll go into here, all the different components to, to create this and then install it, you know, in place afterward. So you're seeing just, uh, again, it's, it's so much artistry and hands-on, you know, that these kids can pursue. And it's, it's just a matter of conveying to the public writ large. Like there's so many opportunities for you guys to find meaning in work in avenues you probably had no idea existed. Yeah. Right. And they do stuff like there's there's a lot of old cemeteries in Charleston. So you've probably seen those people who clean up like the really old graves and fix them and do all that. They, we ran a whole workshop for different churches around the country to come and learn how to restore different tomb boxes and everything. Right. With our stonemasons, because this is a we don't have any around the country to do this work. So it was like, well, let's at least teach the guys at the churches how to do it so they can try to convey this. Right. Because they're just falling into disrepair. And that's real meaningful work. You know, you're taking a gravestone, you know, from the Revolutionary War and you're fixing it. Right. Like that's something you can just genuinely feel good about. You know? Yeah. And I, I think the example of the girl that's currently in Switzerland that you mentioned, I mean, I think that appeals to a lot of people because it's learning a skill. It's meaningful work. And you get, you know, the ability, that type of work is applicable in a lot of different places. Right. It's in demand in a lot of different places. So you actually get to see the world as a result. But you touch on one at, you know, we've been discussing quality, right. And how we've kind of gone away from quality, but you know, the other thing that seems to be lost uh, a lot in today's world is beauty. And you, yeah. you mentioned the, the stone carvings with like the, the transparent veil sort of thing. And then you think back to previous periods in our history, whether it be European or even you go back to the Egyptian sculptures and massive statues and you look at the symmetry and the geometry involved in making these things. And then, then you ask why, you know, why was so much time and meticulous effort placed on, on making these things? And I think one of the main answers is because it's meaningful, because yeah. it, it, it's meaningful to be surrounded by beauty, even if you well, might we're still look, talking about them, right? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and even if you look, you look at a, you know, statue of the Virgin Mary or whatever it is, and you say, well, I'm not particularly religious. It's like, yeah, but, but that's probably not the point. You know, that, that the, the subject of the effort at the time is a part of it, but it's not the full part. I mean, and, and the fact that so much time and effort was placed on creating beautiful things and environments in our past, and that we've 
again, I think in large part gone away from that in our art and our architecture and so many things today. Uh, that says something about us. I don't know exactly what it says, but it definitely says something. And I love how programs like what you guys are doing are kind of re revivifying uh, or revitalizing the pursuit of, of creating and building beauty into our environments and, and implicitly and pr probably explicitly saying that it's worthwhile and meaningful to create beauty. Yeah. No, I mean, you look at modern art installations and who is ever going to them over and over again for repeat visits, right? It's just like, oh, look, it's a jelly bean or, you know, it's just, just abstract shape, right? And then you look at a statue, you know, like the Rape of Persephone, where you can see like the, the fingers gripping her thigh. Yeah. And you just look at that like, oh, my God, that deep, like it speaks to people, right? Mm -hmm. it, and that's everyone. Like I'm, like, I'm a math major. Right. I have no ability to do any of this and it can speak to me. It can reach my robot persona. Right. It can reach anyone's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it, it, it's it's incredible. And I, I think we're we're on the precipice of seeing a revival of an appreciation for the work and effort and meaning that goes into those things and kind of maybe rediscovering why it is it's worth the time to you know, create beauty effectively and reframing uh, perhaps what beauty is. Um, last couple of questions for you, Chad. What's, uh, what's the plans for the college? I mean, we've been talking about how great it is and how, yeah. you know, the students have such a great experience. Uh, is there, you know, a lot of demand coming your guys' way for people that want to enroll at the college or what's that been like? Yeah, so enrollment... Enrollment's been trending upward each year. We're still a tiny college. Our goal is to get to 200 kids, which is tiny. You know what I mean? Right. So this isn't, oh, I went to Ohio State. Is, is, is that because of interest or just capacity for you guys? To no, that's capacity right now. So that's, that I guess is a more short-term plan, right? For our Charleston campus. So that's, that's our goal to get to. Um, it's pretty easy for us to hit max interest in, in wood and blacksmithing and those kind of programs that sort of have the pre-existing interest in them. It's harder for stone and plaster. So that's where we really need to generate more interest in. And like I said, there's tons of opportunities in those fields. And once kids come and see them, it's like, oh my God, of course I want to do this. Right. It's just a matter of them even knowing this is an option. Right. We don't have, you know, a multi-million dollar marketing plan where we can just go out and, you know, run ads all day to get kids interested. So that's our, our short-term goals is to get through that. Long-term, I mean, the college was named the American College of the Building Arts because the idea was at some point you hit capacity here and you build other campuses around the country, really, where you do things we're not necessarily doing in the building arts. So things like, you know, you think about the Southwest and Adobe, right? We're not doing, we're not doing anything. Well, we have a couple of electives where we do rammed earth, hempcrete, natural building kind of stuff, but actually fleshing that out into something more meaningful. Um, there's a roofing program we could add, which with all different types of roofing, which is copper and tin and slate and all these kind of different things that we just don't have the space for here in Charleston. You could do stone where we're doing stone carving, which is very ornamental. There could be more stone actually building. Like you think about it up in New England, there's a lot of kind of ramshackle stone building that you do up there that we're not doing. There's tons of woodworking that we could just, we could build campuses all across the country for more woodworking. There's tons of demand for that. Um, but yeah, that's the idea is eventually you want to have, you know, kind of multiple spots spread around the U.S., whether it's repeating your current model or adding some things, you know, stained glass is another one that we run electives on. And there's tons of interest in stained glass, you know, but fleshing that out into a full program. Yeah, it, it really see, and, you know, this is kind of a comment strictly from uh, Instagram accounts that I follow, but it, it seems like you know, perhaps coinciding with all the critiques we've been making about modern times, there does seem to be uh, a re you know, a, a trend toward, you know, people, whether it's leather work or woodwork or mm -hmm. making knives and stuff yep. like that. There's, yep. I think the, the tools, you know, for let's say direct selling, like a little Shopify Instagram shop, and then you can sell to the world and there's no middleman. I think that has been a part of fostering people to say like, hey, I actually can kind of do something with my hands that I really enjoy and I can support myself uh, by doing that, by selling it, you know, direct to the world. 
So it seems like there's a like a pretty strong trend towards that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I guess you guys are perfectly suited to slide in there and, uh, you know, well, and this gets into two, how to do it the best, like future proofing things. So, I mean, as we get further and further along technologically and AI gets extremely advanced, right. What career fields are going to diminish. Right. right. And so we keep right. hearing things like trucking will go away, which I don't really buy the argument that trucking will go away. Even with self-driving trucks, we've had autopilot in planes since what the 70s and we still have pilots yeah. sitting there Accounts presumably probably, i think it will end up the, the same first to go <laughs> yeah you know i i think we'll end up the same kind of deal with a trucker sitting there sure. regardless of if it's automated or not but there's so many jobs that we don't talk about that will be replaced so when when COVID happened and we had all this work from home stuff if my job can be done from home into the office right where i'm using some kind of internet as the intermediary what is it that I'm actually doing at home and how replicable was that by AI mm -hmm. versus if I'm doing actual blacksmithing? Well, now it's more than just AI. Now I need the physical robot who can do this. So Boston Dynamics really going to have to get on their game, you know, to replicate that, right? Because now there's all these kinetic movements involved, right? So it's just a different order of magnitude of difficulty in replacing you. Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. there's... And we're not talking about like medical billing and coding, like what's going to happen there. That's just middling, you know, the doctor's report to the insurance company. How is that going to exist, you know, in a decade? I don't know. How is insurance adjusting going to exist? How are wills and trust attorneys going to exist? You know, they really kind of don't already they have legal zoom, right? There's a lot of different kind of office jobs that we don't talk about that. Those are sort of low hanging fruit, right? Whereas the stuff with trades, it's like, yeah, you can automate some things and you can do CNC cutting out pieces and everything, but assembly on site is a different ball game, right? And it requires a whole different scale of machinery than we're talking about. Because now it has a physical presence, right? Yeah. And it, it's interesting to think in those terms and to think about how perhaps one of the beneficial aspects of technology is that it's kind of forcing us to refine ourselves back to the things that are most uniquely or most valuably human, right? right? The things that about us that cannot be replicated. And it's kind of right. forcing us and pushing us in that direction. And that I think is something that's exciting because we get to yeah. dig down into ourselves and say, okay, all that menial labor that was just something that we needed to do, maybe we can hand that off. What's within us that's actually something that can't be replicated? Because I feel like that's something of great value. And if we can find ways of manifesting that outside of ourselves, then it will beautify our world and it will probably have a positive impact on the world. So it's, it's interesting to see that trend and, and uh, yeah, I'm look, look forward to seeing it continue. Yeah. Shad, you've been very uh, gracious with your time. I appreciate you chatting with me today about, uh, you know, what you guys are doing at the college and some of the, the philosophy and reasoning behind that. Is there any way or anywhere rather that you'd like to direct people uh, if they want to learn more? Yeah, I would check out the website. It's acba.edu. Real easy. From there, you can find Instagram, Facebook, kind of everything. Just go to the Instagram page and look at the pictures that the kids are They're doing. Awesome, yeah. Most of the times, if you see a picture of some piece that you like, if you click on it, the students are usually tagged in there. So you'll see, you know, X student did this piece and you can go to their page because they've got just tons of stuff. The students are really our best ambassadors. They're not on the payroll. They just put whatever they want out there. They'll tell you what they want, message them, ask them. I mean, they, they love it here, but stuff like that. If you haven't watched the PBS series, it's like a seven or eight minute clip on PBS NewsHour. Did a special right before COVID hit. So it was, it was like, I guess, early, very early March of 2020, like right before all the shutdowns happened. Um, watch, I mean, that's a great piece. And then there's just a lot of articles, but the website's got all that. Just, I would shoot over to acba.edu and just find a picture that inspires you and click on it. And it's <laughs> go from there. Sweet. Well, look, man, appreciate it again and wish you all the best. Look forward to watching the uh, progression of the, uh, the college and uh, maybe we'll speak again in the future. Yeah. Anytime you want. All right. See you, bro.